It's day 17 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Welcome back, friends. We are still in the book of Genesis, chapters 16 through 18, where we will see God continue to give the details of the Abrahamic covenant, while also changing the names of Abram and Sarai to Abraham and Sarah, which is what we mostly know them by. But before we get into it, if you could please help us out, partner with us by hitting that like button, making sure you're subscribed to the podcast or to our channel, and also hitting that notification bell so that you know when every video comes out, because those who have been here know that my videos don't come out at the same time every day. And if you have any questions at all, you can find all the information in the description box or the show notes. Make sure you head on over to our website as well, heartdive.org. That's where everything is kind of just in one place. It's a one-stop shop. And if you want to get your hands on some additional resources, Sources. We also have those available in our heart vault, our shop.heartdive.org. So take a look at that. Otherwise, let's go ahead and pray and get into the word. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another gorgeous day. We thank you, Lord, that we get to breathe this morning, walk a little freer, Lord. We thank you for your mercies that are new to us each and every day, where we can kind of have a restart, a reset. We're so grateful for that because sometimes when we are trudging through life, Lord, it feels like sometimes the road is never ending in the season that we are in, but we are trusting in you, God, and know that we are either going to be walking into, we're right in the middle of, or we're walking out of a storm, but the good news is, is that we always come out of it and that you are with us in the middle of it. So we just thank you for that. We praise you for it, Lord. And I just pray that you will be with every person today, Lord, their, their eyes and ears and hearts will be open to hear you, to receive a word from you. And I pray, God, that if there's anything at all that is trying to come in and distract us, will you cast it out right now in the name of Jesus? Will you open doors, Lord, where there are opportunities for us that you're presenting, but slam shut the ones, God, that we should not be walking through? I pray that as we open your word today, that we will be able to read accurately, clearly, that we will not only be able to just see what's going on, but we will also understand the revelation that is available to us. As we read the Logos, Lord, Lord, you provide the rhema through your Holy Spirit. And so we welcome that today. Please, Lord, nourish our spirits. I pray for a refreshing today. And I just pray, Lord, that your presence will invade the space that we are in right now. We love you. We love your presence. We love being able to just be here with you. So we honor you in this time. And we just pray that it will be holy and sacred. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Starting off here in chapter 16, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go in to my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. Now, while this sounds crazy, it was customary in this time and in this region that people would have surrogates for children because it would have been considered a disgrace not to be able to have children. And oftentimes women were the ones who were blamed for infertility and it would actually be grounds for men to divorce them in this time. So she's clearly worked up about this potential of this public shame that she might face without having children. And I was like, really, Abram? Like we could have stopped this train, but that's okay. God has a purpose. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. So Abram and Sarai have been waiting for more than 10 years for the promise of a child so far. I mean, it's going to be another decade, at least before the promise will actually be fulfilled. And I mean, most of us can hardly even allow a 30 second ad to play on YouTube before we're hitting that skip button, like it's going to eject us up to heaven. And that's the way God works. There is often a waiting period between the promise and the fulfillment of it. And this is a huge part of my own testimony. So those of you who have heard this, bear with me, or you can fast forward. But we got a lot of new people, so I just figured I'd share a little of my heart and my testimony. I actually received three prophecies from three strangers more than 20 years ago when I was in my early 20s. I had just come back from Miss America, and I was singing worship at my church, and I had an elderly woman come up to me in the middle of the crowd telling me she had a word for me. To summarize it, she said, I would speak to the nations. Fast forward a couple of months, singing worship once again, there's a couple who comes up out of nowhere and says, hey, we're visiting. Do you mind if we share with you what the Lord spoke to us? And same thing. 
While you are a worship leader, God is going to use your voice to speak. And then once again, fast forward, and I go to a Bible study where a friend of a friend is visiting from New York, never met me in his life, and he prophesies over me and tells me, you're too big for the islands. You are going to rise up, and you are going to go beyond the borders, and you will speak to the nations. So three confirmations, three of the same prophecy, and now fast forward 20 years, and here we are speaking to the nations. But what happened in that 20 years? Why didn't God do it sooner? It's because I wasn't ready. You see, He had to prepare me for such a time as this. I went into a career of broadcast journalism where I learned how to speak in front of the camera. I learned how to be confident in the public to be able to speak. I learned how to write. And then I had children. I became a mother, learned a whole lot of patience, learned a lot about myself, but also the unconditional love of a parent which gave me a greater understanding of the love of our Father. And then I grew through years of ministering as a worship leader and understanding the responsibility of ministry and the purpose of the church. And then He gave me a job as a lifestyle TV host. And some of you are like, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it was in that job that I learned how to edit video and to do it quickly, which allows me to then pump out daily videos here. So throughout the years, I thought every single time, oh, this must be it. Our news is streaming across the world or our TV show is now playing in Japan or I'm going on a mission trip with my church. God is using me. But it was so much greater than that. I just had no idea on what scale God was going to allow me to speak to the nations, and He needed to use that time. So, He's a God of greater things, but He's also a God of preparation. He does not do things haphazardly. And I love that I can look back on my life and see His fingerprints along every single step of the way. So, heart check, when you look back on your life, can you see God's fingerprints? Or perhaps are you in a season of preparation? And I just say to you, hold on to that promise. Don't let go of it because He is the promise keeper. Because not only is He the promise giver, but He is the promise keeper. Verse four, and He went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Well, this is sad. And Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. So she's blaming Abram now. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. So he's passing the book. You know, he's putting the ball back in her court. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her and she fled from her. And so this kind of shows a little bit of a lapse in the character of Sarai. And of course, that does happen whenever we get into these kind of stressful situations. That is where the worst character is going to come out, right? And it happens to all of us. Verse seven, the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. And this angel of the Lord, and this is the first mention of the angel of the Lord in the Bible. Of course, this being a Christophany, an official one, some of the other ones we were kind of wondering if it was. This one definitely is God showing up before the coming of Christ. So this was in the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? So here God is once again following an act of rebellion and asking questions. And so he's asking the runaway, where have you come from and where are you going? And I'm beginning to sense that these questions are not just God testing his children. These are questions that are on repeat in the Bible for our sake as well, because it's imperative that we do know where we've come from and we should know where we are going. Our entire eternal destiny depends on it. And if we don't recognize our shabby past and know where it potentially leads, then we will have no need for a savior. But when we understand those two things, it will make us all the more aware and grateful for Jesus and the new life that he gives to us. Even if it means toughing it out a bit here on earth, that eternal destination is so much greater and we have to stay focused on that and not take it for granted. So heart check, where have you come from? And where are you going? Does knowing this change your perspective on who God is? So she said, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. And the angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant 
and shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. So the name Ishmael means God hears. Ishmael, by the way, will be the father of the Arab nations. So here is where we see the beginning of the conflict between Israel and and the Arabs. It's not just a modern day war that we're looking at. This goes all the way back to the Bible of Israel versus Ishmael, or even Isaac versus Ishmael. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So in other words, he will be unsettled, always on the go, always at war, which we have seen. So she called the name of the Lord, which this is Yahweh or Jehovah, who spoke to her, you are God of seeing, which is the name El Roy. For she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. And I think one thing we have to remember is that Hagar comes from Egypt. She didn't grow up with this faith in God, yet look at how intimate of a relationship she has with him. And it comes as no surprise to her whenever he showed up on the scene. Through her distress, she recognizes El Roy, the God who sees, and she puts her faith in that. She knows what kind of circumstance that she has to return to, and it isn't going to be a pleasant one. Yet she also understands that God sees her in that he's going to walk with her through it. It's the same way that He sees you and me, and He walks with us through our trials. He sees us in our running. He sees you whenever people come against you. He sees you in the doctor's office. He sees you whenever you are crying out for the salvation of your children. He sees you whenever you are in a financial bind. He sees you when you are agonizing over your own mental well-being. He sees every thought, and He is with you in it developing you for eternity. If Hagar could trust him enough to listen to him and to return, so can we. And now we see the fourth appearance of God to Abraham here in chapter 17. So when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Now, when he says to walk before me, this is saying, I need you to live with an open display of faithfulness. And when he says to be blameless, this means to live with integrity or to live with wholeness, a whole commitment on behalf of Abraham to God. Then Abram fell on his face in reverence, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. So let's take a look here. The name Abram, remember, means exalted father. So he is taking the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which, by the way, the number five in the Bible oftentimes signifies grace, but he's adding that to the name and making it the father of many. And this change from Abram to Abraham is significant because his name is a reflection of his new position. And this shows us that there is power in a name and what you even call people, particularly your children, because the power of life and death is in the tongue. So it may seem insignificant, but I've actually personally witnessed the changing of a name and what it can do. I have a cousin who had a name that I believe meant something along the lines of retaining water. And as a child, she was chronically sick with a kidney disease that would puff her up and make her retain water. And so my auntie ended up changing her name and changing the meaning of her name to somehow meaning that the water would then flow And would you believe that ever since she changed her name, my cousin has never been sick again with that sickness? I don't take that lightly. And my husband and I always talk about how when my son was born, we used to sing over him and say, you're my sweet, sweet boy, my sweet, sweet boy. And he is the sweetest boy. I mean, he's so kind. He's got the greatest manners. And then our daughter, not so much. She was a little bit sassy there for a while. And my husband's like, you didn't sing sweet, sweet girl over her. And so we actually started doing it like, you're my sweet, sweet girl. And I kid you not, her whole countenance changed because we were saying, you're so sassy. And we were calling her those names, speaking that over her, not realizing that we were actually imparting that spirit onto her. And so when we started changing our words and changing what we spoke over our children, it changed the way they actually were. 
So let's do a heart check. Are you conscious of the names either given to your children or the way that you speak them over other people? And that can include your spouse too. I don't know what you're calling your spouse, but it matters. And the beautiful thing is that when we become Christians, we too are given a new name. So heart check again. Are you living up to your new name of saint, righteous, chosen, child of God, and royal priesthood? I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So this covenant was not just for the people, it was for the land as well. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. So why eight days old? Well, they say that back in this day, they believed that that is when the immunity is available to a child. It's at its strongest point and allows them to be circumcised without the memory of pain. But I kind of roll my eyes at that. I'm like, listen, just because a baby can't remember the pain doesn't mean that the pain isn't there. But also some uh, physicians have said that is when the vitamin K is starting to be produced, which allows for blood clotting. I don't know if we have any doctors in our Bible study or nurses or medical practitioners, but if you could shed some light on this act of circumcision, we would love that. But also be reminded that the number eight is the number of the flesh. So he continues, every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant. That was like Sally sells seashells by the seashore. So Sorry, start again. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. So this is something that is necessary. It must happen. He has broken my covenant. And we still practice circumcision today in many cultures. And while it's debated whether or not this is the best medical practice, we aren't doing it for the same reasons that they did here. This act of circumcision was an outward expression of an inward reality. It was a sign of the covenant with God. The cutting away of the flesh symbolized their set-apartness from other peoples. But we as Christians are still called to a spiritual circumcision of the heart. Paul talks about it. So we too must cut away our sinful nature, our fleshly desires, setting us apart from the world. So heart check. Is there anything in your life that needs to be cut off? Verse 15, and God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Now they both mean princess, but he is giving her a new role as well. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. So she's part of this covenant here. I will bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? So I always question whether or not he's laughing in just utter disbelief, or if he is truly being cynical and doubtful here, or is he perhaps rejoicing? I really don't know, but God doesn't really rebuke him in this moment. And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. So he starts to panic here. Like he loves his son and he realizes he's made a mess of his life. And so he's like, God, I need you to bless this mess rather than Lord, okay, have your way here. What about Ishmael? So God said, no, but Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. Isaac, by the way, means laughter. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him, which by the way, of course, Jesus comes from his line. As for Ishmael, I've heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and I will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes or 12 nations and I will make him into a great nation. And so God is renewing and reamplifying Ishmael's blessing here. But will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. And when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. So this kind of shows his transcendence here. 
Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house. And he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day, as God had said to him. So he acts in obedience, which is proving his belief. And Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. So he's leading by example here. Not like our days when we grew up and our parents were like, do as I say, not as I do. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And that very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. And all the men of the house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. So this goes to prove that God's covenant is open and available to all all people. While it was made here with Abraham and intended for the Israelites, he clearly shows that there is an open door for others to be able to come through. Chapter 18, and the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre. Now, Mamre is a significant place. This is where uh, Abraham built the altar after he returned from Egypt. This will be the place that he buries Sarah. And Isaac will also be buried here. So we will continue to refer back here to this place. He sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. Now they're in the desert. This is like 110 degrees. So I'm sure he's sitting here by the door, the only place where there's a little bit of relief coming through in some shade and maybe a little bit of breeze. But I love that God shows up in the heat of the day. And that's what he offers. Often does, right? I mean, he shows up right when you think that you just can't handle the heat anymore. And he lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, three men were standing in front of him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, Oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. So he clearly knows that these are not his typical visitors, that this is indeed God himself with possibly two angels. Now, can you imagine a 90-year-old running to meet the Lord? This just makes my heart leap picturing this scene. And this convicted my own heart as I thought about the way that I approach God each day. So heart check, when God is knocking at your door in the morning, how do you approach Him? Do you run or are you sluggishly trudging your way into His presence? Or are you looking at your phone first? That's me, I'm guilty. Verse four, let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So he is showing some good hospitality here. Some good old Southern hospitality is what some people would say. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seahs of fine flour, knead it and make cake. So he wants her to do it. He's not calling on the servants. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it into a good old yummy stew quickly. He doesn't say that, but I'm saying that because that's what I'm picturing. Can you tell that I'm hungry? I need to eat. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. So fellowship oftentimes happening under the tree, of course, for us, our greatest place of fellowship is on Calvary at the cross with Jesus. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, oh, she's in the tent. And then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years, aka post-menopause. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I really have pleasure? So she's like, am I really gonna be sleeping with my husband and making a baby? I don't think so. And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah just laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And this word hard here actually is the same Hebrew word that is used in Isaiah for the word wonderful. So you could look at this as, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? This would have been full of wonder in this moment. And at the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I didn't laugh. I mean, she was a little bit scared here, I'm sure, to say that she laughed in the face of God, for she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. So notice no condemnation here by the Lord. I mean, what grace and mercy upon Sarah. But he is reminding her of, oh, yeah, you did do wrong there. Then the men set out from there, and they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them. 
to set them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? So here we are getting a little glimpse into the thoughts of God. And it's not like he's sitting there contemplating for himself. He's saying this to be able to reveal his thoughts to us as the reader. And this contemplation is purposeful because he knows what work needs to be done in and through Abraham. And so he's like, okay, I need to show him what is going to take place so that we can then work together. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. So this is where it is crucial for God to reveal what he's about to do. And God will only reveal to those who he knows is going to do something with the knowledge that he has given to them. So he knows that Abraham is going to teach his children, that he is going to do something about what God is about to say. He knows that Abraham recognizes his first ministry being his family. So if you've ever thought that you weren't called into the ministry and you've got a family, guess what? You've been called into ministry because we all have a responsibility, even if we don't have children, because eventually we're going to be spiritual mothers and fathers to those who might be spiritually weaker than us. It doesn't even go by age. Our own parents could even be our spiritual sons and daughters in a sense, in the way that we are able to share our faith with them in an honorable way. Now, don't go telling your unbelieving parents that they are your children, but I hope you see what I'm trying to say. Then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So he's not going down there because he doesn't know what's going on. He's going down there more for the sake of them being able to see him going there so that whenever he brings about this justice, it isn't going to come out of nowhere. And there will be no doubt that God saw with his own eyes exactly what was going on. And it did indeed deserve that judgment. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose that there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing. So he is appealing now to the compassion of God to put the righteous to death with the wicked so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, if I find Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I'll spare the whole place for their sake. And so Abraham's like, uh-oh, I don't think there's even 50 there. So he continues, Abraham answered and said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, no, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. And again, he spoke to him and said, well, suppose 40 are found there. And he answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. And he answered, I won't do it if I find 30 there. And he said, behold, if I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, suppose 20 are found there. And he answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. What incredible patience God is having right now on Abraham. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. And maybe he stopped at 10 here because he was considering Lot and his family and maybe a couple of others. He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham and Abraham returned to his place. Now notice that Abraham is so specific with God. He isn't just tossing vague coins into the streams of heaven and saying, I wish them well. This is why his intercession was so effective. He's looking at what God is about to do, and he has taken into consideration his family that will be right in the impact zone. You see, he never demanded that God do it his way, but he humbly asked according to what he knew of God's character. And he didn't stop short because he knew that their destiny perhaps hinged on the detail of his prayers. This was all part of God working with Abraham to build his faith and leadership. So heart check. Are you tossing coins into heaven or do you have heart to heart conversations? Now taking a look at some deep dive questions, what could Abram have done differently 
in this situation, and that is going back to the situation of not yet having a child, what would your response be if you were in Abram's, Sarai's, or Hagar's place? Does God's covenant and promises encourage or discourage your faith? Can you see the greater purpose of God's covenant playing out today? Do you still believe that God is the God of the impossible? And does this reading inspire your role in intercessory prayer? So Heavenly Father, we know that you are indeed all knowing and all hearing. And we thank you for hearing our hearts cries, even when we don't have the words to even say. Thank you for checking our hearts when our intentions are off or we laugh at things we shouldn't. Forgive us for the times where we have lacked faith or even doubted your promises and took matters into our own hands, thinking that we could will it to happen. And when we have made a mess of our lives, there you were to come and clean it up. And we are so grateful for that. We are especially grateful for the times that we have run away from you in defeat and you've still come after us the way that you do for the one that has strayed from the 99. We cry out for those who are on the run now, Lord. We saw how you chase after the brokenhearted. And so I pray that you will bring them home. You know their names. You hear them in the thoughts of your children and the desperate pleas of their prayers. So I thank you for seeing your purpose through, regardless of our failures. And I pray that we will be able to carry it out even when it doesn't make sense, knowing that you are watching over us and walking through the fire with us and even standing behind us whenever we walk by faith. Thank you for the covenant promise that still stands true today. Because of Abraham's faithfulness, we get to live in the new covenant that allows us to live so freely and to enter boldly into the throne room of grace. So we cry out to you today for our nations, O God. We pray that you will protect us, watch over us, grant us mercy as we stand before you in righteousness. If there is but one, will you not allow us to be destroyed? May our people turn back to you in repentance and humility. Help us, Lord, to show them the way. We thank you, Lord, for this time together as a family. I pray that you bless every person. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and every single one of us have fallen short, and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I wanna be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die, but I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer and I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.